If anyone sells kits on eBay and is watching this video, please take note. This is how you ship a model kit. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale U.S. Marine Corps LAVM. The model in this video is built for my own personal collection, it's not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these build videos, they frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. The model that we have here is built extensively out of the box, so we're going to be going over the kit's features as well as giving the model a thorough inbox review. So stay tuned because there's going to be a bit of info coming right at you. To kick this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the U.S. Marine Corps' LAVM. The LAVM is a offshoot from the U.S. Marine Corps' LAV-25 armored car. The LAV-25 is a light eight-wheeled armor car that is in service with the U.S. Marine Corps. The vehicle entered service in the early 1980s time frame and is still in continuous service up through today. During the early 1980s, the Marines went ahead and put out a requirement for a new light armor vehicle to fulfill a multitude of different roles. And a few companies came up to the plate with vehicle designs, one of which was GM, which had an adapted version of a eight-wheeled armor car, which was a licensed copy of another vehicle that was designed in Europe, while the other contender was Cadillac Gage, which had another improved version of a vehicle which was basically similar to the XM706 armored car, which did see service with the U.S. military in the Vietnam War. Of the submissions that were entered, the GM was the one that won and was adopted by the U.S. Marine Corps as the LAV-25. What made the GM version so appealing was the fact that it is a heavily adaptable vehicle and it can be adapted into fulfilling a bunch of different roles but keeping the same basic chassis, running gear, and most importantly the drivetrain. The standard LAV-25 was going to utilize a turreted chain gun however the other versions of the LAV-25 were adapted into a command center, a air defense version, and most importantly for the purpose of this video here, the mortar carrier. For the main armament, this vehicle was going to utilize a single M252 81mm medium weight mortar, which was going to be mounted in the rear portion of the vehicle. When the mortar was not in use, the vehicle was completely buttoned up. However, in order to deploy the mortar, the rear section had a number of doors that would open up, revealing for a nice wide open fighting compartment, which had ample clearance in order to operate the mortar. The mortar was built into a fully revolving base plate and because of that the mortar can achieve just about any angle of elevation and also rotation that would best suit the situation at hand. In addition to the mortar being mounted inside the vehicle, it can also be dismounted and used outside of the vehicle if the need be ever arose. In addition to the mortar, for secondary armament, the vehicle utilizes a single 7.62mm M240 MG. This is located on a pinnel mount that's positioned near the commander's cupola. Outside from the mortar modifications, the vehicle is still an LAV-25 and utilizes the same drivetrain, transmission, and engine which is found on the other contemporaries. This would include the Detroit Diesel 6V 53T 300 horsepower engine. Also, just like with the other versions of the LAV-25 family, this vehicle was fully amphibious, which obviously for the Marine Corps is something that is very important. There have been about 50 of these mortar variants of the LAV-25 that have been produced and all of which seem to still be in service with the U.S. Marine Corps. The vehicles as well as with the remainder of the LAV fleet have been continuously upgraded over the years since they've been adopted, giving them more modern equipment and other modern features which the Marines implement on their newer vehicles. The vehicles are estimated to be in service until the year 2035, to which then they will eventually be phased out and a new vehicle will go ahead and take their place. 
Before we go any further, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this vintage Italeri LAV25 water carrier. This here is another one of those kits that I always saw and bumped into in my youth, but for one reason or another, I never got it. But it was always a kit that I always did want to add to my collection. Well, fast forward a number of decades later, I finally have one of these kits in my collection, so it's one more off the checklist, so to speak. Although this kit here dates back to the year 2000, the tooling for the majority of the kit dates back to the early to mid 1990s. Like I mentioned in another Italeri LAV25 video, during the 1990s time frame, Italeri went ahead and tooled up a number of LAV25 based kits. With the way Italeri designed their kits, they were pretty smart with the execution, where they tooled up a basic lower hull for the LAV25, as well as a top portion with an interchangeable rear section. This is crucial because this is really the important part that differs from the various incarnations of the LAV25, be it the AD, the standard 25mm chain gun version, or the variant that we have here with the mortar. Unlike those other kits though that were tooled up by Italeri in one big chunk in the mid-1990s time frame, this one here came out a number of years later in the year 2000. As far as I know, I don't believe Italeri have ever made any newer versions of the LEV25 platform of vehicle since the release of this kit here. At the time of release, this was really the only rendition of this particular variant of the LEV25 around in plastic in 135th scale. Prior to the Italeri kits of the LEV25 being produced, the only other option was the one from Eshi, which is a decent kit in its own right. However, the tooling on it is much more primitive compared to the tooling found on the Italeri counterpart. The LAV25 Italeri kits were always pretty popular because of their affordability. These kits were never really super expensive, and because they were so prolific, they were really easily attained, and again, they do have a lot of room available for further alterations. In recent years, there have been a number of new tooling kits of LEV25 based vehicles that have been released, one of which I believe is from Trumpeter, and I haven't currently yet worked on one of those Trumpeter kits, but from what I've seen and what I've been told, they seem to be pretty good, and that's not surprising because those kits tend to be designed with modern tooling and technology compared to the older kits here from the 1990s. But with that said, I always found the LEV kits from Italeri here to be very good and are, in my opinion, just as viable today as they were all those years ago when they first came out. These kits here were pretty prolific for a very long period of time and are still relatively easy to find even today. Although I don't believe Italeri has re-released this kit here and the version that we have here on the table is actually one of the original year 2000 releases that I'll touch upon in a moment. As I've mentioned in a few other videos, Italeri always had a pretty good distribution network, so tracking down one of these kits in the wild was never really too difficult. These were the type of things you would find in a hobby shop type scene, or you would find them in a mail order catalog. These days, you're probably going to find them, if not tucked away in, an, in a corner of some you know, hole-in-the-wall hobby shop. Chances are really good you might snag one at a garage sale, a swap meet, a model show, or like I did with this one here, off of eBay. So, starting with the model's graphic design, like I touched upon before, this is the original 2000 release of the model. And the reason why I say that is with the graphic design and the typography. At this time, the Italeri kits featured this type of format, where we have just the box art right here, and then the remainder of the typography and logo placement was in this format. And this was true for Italeri kits throughout the 1990s time frame, and it wasn't until the mid-2000s was when they would change up the graphic design on their packages. Starting with the box art itself, here we have a pretty decently rendered scene where we have the LEV25, of course it's a US Marine Corps vehicle, the rear bays are open, and the mortar is ready to be fired. The illustration is decently rendered, and it's quite typical for these Italeri kits. Here's the Illustrator's signature right there in the bottom, and this Illustrator has done a number of Italeri kits over the years. The remainder of the box art's pretty simple. There's not like an action scene or anything else going on. It's a nice tranquil setting of the vehicle parked with its 
mortar bay open. As for the rest of the graph design, here we have the title of the vehicle. It's in that typical 1990s styling for Italian kits where we have the model's name and then we have this little drop shadow vortex thing going. In the upper right hand side we have the Italeri logo as well as the other information being a 135th scale plastic model kit and of course the kit number which is number 378. Bottom of the box we have this blue stripe. This would change on a few of the kits. Sometimes it's yellow, green, red. You know, it just depends on the kit in question. And on the side portion over here we have just a quick little thumbnail of the, the model on the box art and again the same information with the same typeface. Same thing on the reverse side. On this tab over here, we have a brief description of the vehicle in question and what's always neat about Italian models is that they have a ton of languages present on the side of the box as Italian does sell to a lot of different countries around the world. On the opposite side, we have just some corporate information, barcode, year of release, and all that good stuff. Cracking open the box to reveal the kit contents, you're going to see a very simplistic plastic model kit. And what I mean by that is, just like I mentioned on the other Italeri LEV25 kit videos, is that this model here is all injection molded plastic. There are no other modern amenities that are found on this kit here. And what I mean by that are things like vinyl or rubber tires, photo etch, brass, turned aluminum. None of those type of things are present on these kits. It's just pure polystyrene injection molded plastic. Which, of course, you're going to see pretty quickly. But first thing we have here is the instruction manual. Usually I talk about these at the end of the unboxing because they're generally at the bottom of the box. But since this model was purchased secondhand, and by the way, the vendor did an excellent job with packaging the plastic parts here. I mean, the thing is in immaculate condition. Uh, you know, we'll go ahead and mix it up a little bit. So here we have the instruction manual here. It's very simplistic, which is what one would expect for an Italeri kit from this period. The instructions are pretty straightforward and are mostly clear and concise. I'm not sure if there's going to be any problems with the instructions in terms of mistakes as there have been one or two found on several other older Italeri kits from the past, but for my experience with working on their other LAV25s, that doesn't seem to be the problem and I'm pretty sure that's going to be the experience with this one here. With the instructions out of the way, we can now dive into the actual kit components. Like I said before, most of these components are going to be identical across the Italeri LEV25 range, with the exception of one runner that's going to consist of the components like over here, which differentiates it from the other variants. Also, one thing I want to mention is that on this particular example, it's molded in this green or olive drab type plastic. This is different compared to some of the other examples of the Italeri LEV25 that I've built in the past, where they were one weird shade of brown or yellow. However, the tooling, of course, is identical. Looking at the tires, you'll notice that the wheels on this model are a two-part assembly, and from my experience, they go together pretty well and have some pretty decent detailing on them. The phase detailing is present on the thread, as well as also you can see all of the lug nut detailing molded in as well. Some other components would consist of the propellers, side view mirrors, headlights, prop shafts, hatch, as well as even some hubcaps all of which are decently rendered. Some other equipment found on this runner is the suspension that we have here. One thing that's nice about this kit is that the suspension is one drop in unit, which does give you quite a bit of detailing, but it also cuts down on the complexity of the component. However, I do want to point out that on one of the examples of the LEV25 that I built, this part here led to some serious problems, and I actually had to rebuild some of it because of a fitting issue. What's also interesting to point out is that I built a couple other examples where it, the problem was non-existent and the builds went by without any problem. So it's going to be interesting to see how that pans out on this one. But because of my experience with the last one, I am going to be taking a lot of the care and attention when assembling this setup that we have here. But more on that is to come. Of course, the largest component found on this runner is the upper hull molding. The component is appropriately scaled and sized, and the detailing on it is rendered very well. You can see all the fittings that are present, and several of the components have their weld beads integrally molded in. The weld beads are also found on the various locations where they would be found on the real vehicle, which is again a nice touch. 
One other thing to mention is that you'll see in the light here that the kit has several suggestion points that are faintly molded on. And this is a tray found on many Italeri kits because again, Italeri likes to recycle their tooling for the various kits that they produce. In terms of the LAV25, because these runners are used for all of their kits, you are going to have suggestion points found on the upper hull over here for renditions of the LAV25 that are not going to be for this particular version. So this means that the suggestion points that you're gonna need, you're gonna use, and the ones that are not necessary, you're going to need to remove. A common mistake out there that a lot of novices or several people that don't know make when they're building a, a, an Italian model is that they'll build the model but they forget about the suggestion points and they just you know complete and paint it in that format. Well the suggestion points are still visible even with the paint on it so it is something that can hurt the look of the build and it's something that the builder has to pay attention to. Fortunately these suggestion points are very easily removed with a little bit of fine sandpaper but again it's one of those things that they don't really tell you in the instructions but it is something that you should know when you're working on an Italian kit. Undoubtedly there are going to be several fittings on here that are not going to be necessary for this particular example but I'll touch upon that as the video goes on. Okay the next runner which is neatly tucked underneath this bubble wrap blanket is the lower hull. This is the other runner that's used on all of the Italeri LEV25 kits for the same reasons that I think I've already mentioned multiple times. The piece is very nicely rendered. You can see all of the complex bends and angles that are integrally molded on. Just like with the upper, it has some well bead detailing present as well as suggestion points for several details. But unlike the upper, I believe all the suggestion points on the lower are utilized. Some of the other details would include the rear plate here. Note on the Italian example, the rear doors are not molded in, which is a big improvement over the older Eshi kits that had them molded as one piece. Directly above it, we have the exhaust manifold as well as the smoke grenade launcher bases. Here we have some other sections of the drivetrain. These are the drive shafts. The LEV25 kits give you a lot of jerry cans. I'm pretty sure I may have some leftover spare, but we'll see as the build goes on. One other thing to mention is that there are a lot of very important details found on this sprue. This will include all these little hookup points found right along this line, the brush guard mounts, other lift points, and, uh, and also including all the small little shock absorber systems. This is extremely noteworthy to point out because you don't have enough if you lose one. You only have enough on here for one model. So if you lose one of these pieces, you're going to be screwed. So you have to ex exhibit a lot of care and a lot of patience when building one of these. Note the pieces are molded very small and you have to not only remove them off the sprue, deburr them, and get them mounted to the model without any of them flinging off the Lost Paria. This is something that I've had a few uh, close calls on, on some of the other examples, so we'll see how that pans out on this one. But I just want to stress that at this point here, you don't want to mess around with these parts, and you really want to take your time and work in a very clean environment because these are the type of things that can and will fling off the Lost Partia. And again, if, it, if they do, you're gonna be pretty much screwed. So let that sink in. Moving along, we have the taillights as well as the rear doors, rudders, and more suspension components. And that's it for this runner. So this takes us to the last runner. And of course, this is the one that's special because this is the runner that differentiates it from the other LAV25 examples. This one here consists of all the components for the mortar version, and this particular version of the Italeri LV25 kit supplies you with a partial interior detailing set, which you can see right here with this floorboard along with this disc that the mortar will mount to. One thing that's pretty cool, it looks like that the mortar can rotate like a mini turret that we have right over here, and this system is very similar to the one found on the Tamiya mortar variant of the M113, but that's a topic for another video. We see some other interior components like walls, benches, all that good stuff. This appears to be the mortar right here. Again, everything is nicely rendered and looks to be something that should go together fairly well. We have the roof section right over here, as well as also the roof mortar bay area doors. 
All in all, it looks to be a nicely detailed kit. On the very bottom of the box, we have here a set of water slide decals. These, of course, are the kit original ones. They appear to be your standard type Tallery water slides with the type of paper used as well as with the quality of the printings on them. The condition is, uh, I don't want to say rough, but they're definitely not factory fresh. There's a bit of crud on the surface of the decals, but I've had decals look like this before and they worked fairly well. Uh, I don't think they're going to go full-blown eshi mode on me, where if they make contact with the water, they just disintegrate. But we'll see how that pans out. I do want to say that I have had mixed results in the past on Italo remarking. Sometimes they go on pretty good and there aren't any problems. Other times, less so. But we'll see how that pans out specifically after the VMS matte varnish gets applied. Because that's usually the best coating for decals like this or just any worse like decals in general. Jumping ahead a little bit, here we have the model in its construction phase. And just like with most of the models that have interior detailing, I might as well take a moment to show what the interior looks like once it's fully completed, just before everything gets sealed up. Because as like what's true with most tank models with interiors, once the model's buttoned up, you're not exactly going to have a whole lot of easy accessibility in order to see all the components on the inside. The quality and execution of the interior detailing is very similar to what we saw on the Italeri M113 that I built a little while ago. If we can recall in that video, the model does supply you with the interior detailing. However, it is fairly basic with its overall execution, and there are several fittings and components that are found on the real unit that are omitted on the example that we have here. This, by the way, is not just something that Italeri has done, but it's also seen on several other kits on the market, both past and present. Uh, another one would be the Bronco V100 armored car. That was another example where, yeah, they give you the interior, but again, it's a bit on the basic end, shall we say. So starting with the bulk of the interior, which is all found on the lower hull section, on the model, the rear section is pretty well fleshed out. However, the front section is a bit on the spare end. As you can see, the internal compartments don't even extend all the way to the front of the vehicle and basically just cut off right over here where we have the access panel to get into the engine. The driver section is also fairly sparse where the only thing you have is a steering wheel. However, the remainder of the controls like the accelerator pedal, the brake, the stick shift, all those other fairly important bits of equipment are absent. This is also true for the instrument panels, which would be found on the inside. The seat detailing is fairly basic. You know, it's there. It gets the job done, in my opinion, pretty well. Moving backward, takes us to the fighting compartment. Like I said before, this is really where the bulk of the kit's interior is focused. So we can see several crew amenities, such as the ammunition cans there in the corner. These are painted in my usual format where I take yellow paint and add the little yellow identification letters. Hopefully that comes out on camera. But those are found on both ammo cans. That's a trick that I like to do. Again, gives a little bit extra detailing. The remainder of the floorboards are pretty well done as per the kit. They do assemble fairly well. There aren't any locking or intersection problems. So basically, once the pieces get fit into place, they fit very well and there's not really a whole lot of hand fitting required. The other bit of component that's right here, which is, takes up the bulk of the rear area, is this shelf. The shelf is a multi-component piece. The shelf goes together fairly easily. However, one thing you have to be careful is when it, you're test fitting it or when you're installing it, the pegs that are found on the bottom legs here of the shelf may be a little stuck on the corresponding locations found on the floorboards. And if you're putting pressure on it, the whole thing can collapse on you. And this is exactly what happened to me. So luckily I was able to re repair the piece in the exact same condition as it was when it was first built. But this is something to keep in mind if anyone's building one of these kits and you encounter this section of the build. The component, again, it's I really dig the detailing on it. It has all those little holes that are found for the shelf adjustment. And on this side here, it has what I peer, or I, I believe what is a, uh, an M16 or a rifle rack. Uh, that's what it appears to be on several other vehicles I've built around this era. And uh, again, nicely rendered, and it goes together very well. 
Over here on the shelf, we have the tripod, or I should say the bipod for the mortar, and this is for when the mortar is dismounted from the vehicle. And I will be touching more upon that as the video progresses, but the piece is supplied with the model. It's simply just painted, weathered, and then mounted in place. The kit suggests the bipod get mounted in this location, so I just simply secured it as per the kit instructions. To the opposite side, we have a bench. The bench is again, Pretty decently rendered. What's cool is it has its little seat belts molded in and in order to make them pop a little bit more just with a fine paintbrush I just painted them in the format that you see here with the straps being painted with a different type of a nylon webbing type color and the buckles are just painted in silver. The kit also supplies you with several rounds for the mortar rounds themselves and the storage containers are plastic on the real vehicle. So I painted them accordingly. As for where they get fitted inside the vehicle, the kit's really vague on that. It's basically, they have some suggestion points, but again, this is really up to the builder's discretion. And for this build, I just pulled them over here nice and neatly in the corner. But again, if you're building one of these, you can scatter them basically anywhere you want. One other thing I want to mention is that the interior detailing is done after the suspension is fully completed. This is done because both the suspension and the interior are a bit fragile and when you're trying to assemble the suspension after the interior is already painted and weathered and fitted in place, it can cause some issues. That's why it's best to start low, work your way up to the insides, and then you could complete the remainder of the vehicle once the interior is completed. On the upper portion, there's nothing really much going on over here with the exception of this fire suppression system, which again is kit supplied and hopefully you could get it to focus. There aren't any other type of fitting supply with it. It's just the two canisters that we have here with the molded in details. On the real vehicle, there is a plethora of other stuff going on in here where these are all interconnected with the fire suppression system with little tubes and other gizmos. Also on the inside of the lower, there are a ton of other details from I've seen from real examples of the LAV25 from the space heater to just, there's a lot of stuff going on on the inside here. If I was to give a percentage on how complete this interior is, I would say about 20%. So, you know, is this something that might be a deal breaker for you? Uh, that depends on some individuals out there. It might be. Uh, others, it's actually a good base or a starting point to work from. With these interiors here, you can actually upgrade them either with scratch building the remainder of the details, or I believe there may even be some aftermarket accessory sets that will flesh out the remainder of what the kit already gives you. So that is something to keep in mind for those type of individuals that are looking for that type of an experience. Uh, for this build over here though, out of the box should be just fine. And as you can see, once the top goes on, it really does cover up the majority of the front section since this model is gonna be buttoned up with its hatches. You're not really, or I should say the front sections that are absent aren't something that's really gonna be a concern to me. Back to the remainder of the interior detailing takes us to the mortar. So the mortar, like I touched upon before, is on this little rotating plate and it's actually really decently rendered. The detailing on the mortar is very nicely done. As you can see, you can see the little ribs that we have right over here molded into the bottom portion. This is as per the real unit. The funnel section is also nicely rendered, as is the remaining section here of the bipod. The detailing found on the Base itself is also pretty good, it has that diamond plate molded in, which is looks really good when you highlight it with the dry brushing like I did over here. And luckily with the way the piece is assembled, it just rotates in like a tank turret, so I don't have to have this piece fitted to the model until the very end of the build where I could go ahead, paint and weather everything, do the varnishing and all that stuff, take off all the masks, and then just secure this thing in place with a simple twist. So that's again a very nice feature that this kit does have. On that note, you'll see I went ahead and masked this area up here, and this is something that I typically do on my build, specifically ones with turrets, because if you get paint on this location, it it's gonna make the rotation of the piece difficult, and on a tank, it's more of a nuisance than anything, but on something this frail and fragile, you're just looking for trouble, and you can possibly break the unit before the model's even finished. The next thing we have here are the rear doors. These are standard on all of these Italeri LAV25 kits and it was just assembled out of the box with nothing really to talk about. What's cool about the LAV25 kit from Metallery is that it does give you all the detailing that you see here, which will include these, I believe, are periscope guards, or their, their vision block shields, and we also have the little latches that are found on the inside and the outside. 
the interior sections have been painted. Of course, they will be secured onto the model after the upper and lower hull sections are mounted and the bodywork is also concluded. On the top portion, we just have the roof section. Again, just paint and weather to match the remainder of the vehicle. And we have this front section over here, which doesn't really connect to anything. It is going to be secured to this location here on the front of the vehicle, but as you can see, there are no entry points found on the top portion here of the upper hull. So this, if you're building one of these and you want to render this in the open manner, you are going to have to do some surgery here to this area of the build. One last thing I do want to touch upon with the interior is with the color. On past builds on this channel, you'll see several of my post-World War II American AFV painted with an interior blue color like this one over here, which is just Model Master Blue. And this color does work because I have seen a couple vehicles with this type of paint on the inside. However, for this model here, I want to do something a little bit different. And I was actually really inspired by the real XM706 E2 armored car that I had the opportunity and privilege of seeing and documenting at the last couple of military vehicle shows. I even interviewed the owner of that vehicle, which by the way, I want to give a shout out to him. He's a really cool dude. And in that video, we were talking about the interior and the color that he used and specified was a color called seafoam green. And that vehicle did stick out of my mind. And after doing some research online, which by the way, Images for the LEV25 are a bit spare, specifically for like interior images, but from what I have seen on several of those images, this seems to be the color to go with. Now, a good off-the-shelf counterpart to Seafoam Green is actually Tamiya XF21 Sky. This color mimics Seafoam Green almost perfectly. In fact, uh, I don't know why they just didn't call it Seafoam Green, honestly. The color may look a little different on the camera as it does in person as I'm looking at the viewfinder here and the tint is slightly different, but the color is a really good representative of it. The paint simply gets airbrushed into the appropriate locations. Of course, this is done when everything is not assembled. Basically, I just have the model in a sub-assembly format, everything gets airbrushed, weathered separately, and then everything gets in assembled in the configuration you see here prior to the thing getting sealed up. But the base coat is just airbrushed on. To me, it's you know, great for that. And for the weathering, I use my usual techniques, which are edging with the dry brush, some washes with the Tamiya panel line accent, as well as also some dry brushing, which gives you the result that we have here. For the floor of the mortar, you'll notice that I went with a olive drab color, and this is something that I have seen on several examples of not just this particular vehicle, but even uh, the Striker version, and I believe the, yeah, the M113 mortar carrier has a similar type of a system. Although, interestingly enough, unlike some of those other vehicles where the entire floorboards are painted in olive drab, on the LAV25, it's not the case, and it's just the seafoam green. So, that was something that did catch my eye a little bit. Starting with the running gear, the suspension on the Italeri LAV25 kits are fiddly and easy at the same time, which is amazing how something like that can actually happen. To better get an idea, let me go ahead and tip the model over so you get to see what the undercarriage looks like. So with the model placed on its side as if Robocane was running amok outside City Hall, here's where you really get to see the details of the LEV25 kit in better light. In a nutshell, the kit is nicely detailed in this area. We have cool swing arm details, turn knuckle details, drive shaft details, along with several shock absorber details. All of these components are well laid out on the runners and are equally well illustrated on the instruction sheets. However, one thing that the builder does need to pay attention to is with the many descending shock absorbers that come from this area over here, you need to carefully line them up appropriately with the swing arms that are found on the center spine. Again, it is doable, but it's something that you do want to take your time with and use adhesives that dry fairly slowly because if you're using the fast dry stuff, this may lead to a problem. The one thing that I want to mention that makes the unit relatively easy to put together is with this section that we have here. As we saw in the unboxing portion, the spine, the swing arms, the drive shafts, and I believe even the turning knuckles are all integrally molded as one piece and just drops right on in one complete cartridge type of an install, which on paper is great. You know, it's really nice that they did that. However, one thing about these Italeri LEV25s is that this can sometimes lead to some problems. 
this is, again, a weird quirk that I encountered on a couple of these LAV25 kits that I built in the past where on some examples, the piece just goes on without any sort of problems. Other times, you may need a little bit of hand fitting here or there in order to get the piece to go into its appropriate location. And other times, the fit is actually quite bad and you really got to do some heavy modifications to some of the locations just to get the piece to fit in in the appropriate way. And this all seems to be really the luck of the draw, which kind of makes me guess that I think there are several molds that Italy has that produces these kits. And because of that, you do have some variations amongst each individual mold where some parts may not necessarily be in spec. It sounds strange. However, if anyone doesn't believe me, watch the commission build Italy LEV 25 AD video that I did. And fast forward to the point where I talk about the suspension cause. Wow. <laughs> Let's just say it's a miracle I was able to save that build. And some people probably would not have been able to have that type of luck. But anyway, needless to say, if you're working on any of the Italy LV 25s, yeah, pay a strong attention to this area over here. On this example, I don't think it was that bad. I do remember I did have to do some sort of hand fitting, but again, nothing nearly as egregious as some of the, or that one other example of this kit that I already referenced. As for the rear suspension sections, no problems at all. This area is actually pretty well ironed out and goes together with a breeze. With the model right side up, let's continue with the kit's features. So in this area here, we have one of the cooler aspects I find on the LEV25 family, and that's its propeller and amphibious equipment. So we have a propeller, we have a prop mount, and also two rudders, and of course it's a mirror image on the opposite side. The Italeri components are decently rendered and go on fairly easily. There is a small little injection pin found on the mount over here on the flange section that gets glued to the side of the hull, and this is something that can potentially cause some fit issues. So if you're working on one of these models, just put a little hobby knife or an exacto, just snip that little chunk of plastic off, and the piece will be able to fit on with much more ease. The next thing to mention is with the rear plate, and this is probably the biggest area to watch out for for the builder because of all of the little finely molded bits of details that get glued in this section here, and to a lesser extent, many of which are carried over on the front. As you can see, this vehicle has lots of little tow points, or hookups I should say for U-shackles that are found over here, and we have a matching set on the front underneath that little armor plate that's right there on the bow. These pieces, along with the brush guards, are extremely finely molded, and it's one of those things that just beckon and are asking to be lost and flung off to Los Partia. And if this happens, you are screwed. There are no backups, so what you see on the kit is what you get. So when you're building one of these models, build it in a location where you're in a tube or something, where if something flings off, you can find it and track it down. It would also behoove you to have a nice set of small little tweezers on hand so you can carefully manipulate the pieces to where they need to go. As you can see with my finger over here, it's a bit tricky to go ahead and put these pieces on with your actual hand. So again, some tooling would be a good idea. On the brush guards, this is amplified because the brush guards are comprising of three pieces. We have the main guard itself and then these two columns at the center from either side. These pieces are each separately molded and to make matters worse you have to do it twice. So again you want to stay on the ball when you're assembling these components. These little angle sections here are just those type of pieces that not only can go off the Lost Partia but chances are will stick to your fingers long before they will stick to the model itself. So again tooling is going to be basically required by the builder in order to get these things on without the place looking like a giant fingerprint. The remainder of the details go on without any sort of problems. The rear hatches go on very easily. The hatches are nicely rendered because they have handles on the inside and the outside. And I touched upon before, they have their interior detailing on them and you can decide to render them either in the clothes or open state. Obviously for this model here I have them buttoned up, but if you want to render this for a diorama or anything along those lines, yeah, you could, you know, have the piece rendered in the open state. This bit of equipment here, in case anyone's wondering, is actually for the mortar. When the mortar is not hooked up inside of the vehicle, you need this to strap to the bottom base plate so you can stick it into the ground. But that's something that, you know, I could talk about a little bit when I get to the interior. Jumping to the front section, you can see more of those small little details 
that I was referencing earlier. Along with the small little U-hook sections, we also have other tie-down points that are present on the sides of the vehicle. On the LEV25, there's two right here on the lower portion. One is, of course, on the opposite side. And the other one is actually on the t upper hull area on the superstructure, but you'll see that once I pan the camera to that angle. Moving upward takes to the bow area details, and we have the headlight clusters. The headlight clusters on the LEV25 kits are nicely rendered because everything is actually a separate molding that gets assembled in a sub-assembly prior to getting fitted to the vehicle. This lends itself for some nice geometry, and you do have some nice detailing integrally molded on these pieces because of this format. One last thing to mention about the lights is to get them painted with their appropriate colors. Of course, this is an easy thing to enhance your build. The format is with the way you see it here. The two large lights right there on the bottom are painted in orange. The white lights are right over here, and they're just basic silver. And the blackout light is right over here, and hopefully I could get this on camera. But one thing that I like to do on my blackout lights is underneath the little hood section over here, I take a sliver of silver paint and just paint a nice little horizontal line. If anyone has ever seen a real blackout light, you'll notice that the hood has a little rectangular cutout underneath it, and that's where the light actually shows through. By painting this with a paintbrush, it's an easy way to enhance your model and give it just a little bit of extra polish. Of course, on the reverse sides, there would be the side view mirrors, and this is, you know, what you would see like on any truck that drives by on the highway. And for this, I just painted them with silver. For the taillights, there is a bit of a format in how they get painted. Specifically on modern era American or NATO pattern AFVs, they are in the following format. You have the lens right over here, and that's painted in red. Then there are two smaller lights found in these two locations, in these rectangular cutouts. For the model here, those are painted in silver. This is something you want to pay attention to because, again, it's one other way to really make the model pop as opposed to just painting the red portion of the light and ignoring the other two, or, like I've seen on far too many builds, just paint the entire face of the taillight completely red. That's obviously less than ideal. Or not even paint them at all. That's also something I've seen quite a bit. So, again, it's a real easy way to enhance all your models, just paint the taillights. The details are molded in, just waiting for you to throw the paint onto them. Moving topside takes us to the hull sections. And as I touched upon in the other LAV25 videos, you do have some bodywork to contend with on these locations. With the way the hulls go together, you will have a seam found in this section over here where the upper lower sections join, but you will also have a seam on the rear area here where the rear plate makes contact with the upper hull. This is all taken care of with a little bit of putty and also a little bit of super glue and then just sandpaper takes care of the rest. After a few swipes, the locations are completely polished down, leaving for the smooth appearance that we have here. Also, something else to consider is that on this version of the LEV25, you do have several molded in suggestion points that need to be deleted by the builder. Like I touched upon before, these Italery kits are optimized so that with one mold they can make about four or five different kits with the same tooling. And because of this you will have certain suggestion points molded in depending on the vehicle that you're working on. Well to build this rendition here most of those suggestion points need to go and this is easily done again with some fine sandpaper. It's one of those things that you have to take care of because if you ignore it they will be seen once the model is fully painted and weathered and it's something that can really hurt the look as opposed to help you. So bear that in mind if you're working on one of these kits the suggestion points need to be deleted if not for your rendition. On the opposite side, we have here the exhaust manifold. This is, again, the kit original, and the kit is decently rendered in this regard. The piece does have a partial two-part assembly right here on the exhaust tip, and other than just taking care of some of the bodywork in that section and removing some mold lines, which are present on the other portions of the tooling, that's really all there is to it. The piece goes on pretty well, and the only thing to really mention is with the exhaust, you want to have a nice pronounced poof right over here, as this is very commonly seen on the real examples. The remainder of the details include the jerry cans, like I mentioned in the other videos. This kit just supplies you with a ton of jerry cans, which is actually really nice because you can either use them to enhance your build, or you could just keep them in your spares and use them for a rainy day. The jerry cans are the vehicle-mounted ones, which is also a very nice touch, specifically, again, if you want to mount them onto a vehicle, 
you already have all the appropriate details represented. The quality of the parts are also pretty good. Italeri basically has a copy and paste type format for some of their components, their jerry cans included. The jerry cans are the USGI steel can with the jerry can mount integrally molded here on the bottom, and they have a decently rendered strap right there along the midsection. The strap is painted with a NATO green type coloring, of course a vehicle from this era, that's the type of weapon material that would be present, and the tray itself would be physically attached to the vehicle, so it would be the same color as the vehicle. The one thing that's always interesting about their jerry cans though is that I'm pretty sure that by this era, these World War II pattern of USGI cans would not necessarily be in service anymore, and you would tend to see more of the plastic cans in use. However, I'm pretty sure though there may be a few of these cans running around specifically in the 1970s, 1980s period that we're talking about for this particular example. So it's not necessarily a ding, but it is one of those things that if you're working with some aftermarket parts, perhaps it might help the build if you swap them out for something a little bit more contemporary. This is specifically true if you're rendering it with a more modern example of this vehicle with the three-tone NATO camo. I'm pretty sure by that point the metal jerry cans were no longer really a thing. Or perhaps I'm wrong, any leather neck out there, feel free to mention that in the comments section below. Also on this area here, we get to see the fuel filler cap. Of course, I rendered in my usual format with that spillage technique, which is all too common on real heavy equipment that I've seen in real life. And here we have some extra bits of tools. All these go on without any sort of problems in their allocated locations. The one thing though that I do want to mention is with the rear hook that we have here. The rear hook is of course supplied with the mall and the and the suggestion points are present and they are prominently seen. The problem is their location is really bad because like I touched upon before, this area here, you do have to do body work in order to fuse in the rear plate with the upper hull. And a casualty of that are those suggestion points for this hook. And it's one of those things where you really need to know where those hooks are because you can easily screw up the pitch as well as also the general location. One trick that you can do is that with a very small Dremel bit on a pin vise, you either add an indentation or a straight up tiny little hole in the center of the two suggestion points on either side. This is so that when you do the body work, those holes or those dimples may still be present and you will know even after all the body work is done, the exact location where the hooks need to be placed. Also on this area over here, this brings us to the rear antenna bases. These are kit supplied and the kit ones are decently rendered. In order to improve them further with a pin vise and a very small Dremel bit, I simply drilled out the centers and added a length of floor wire to each, giving you the detailing of the antenna. The antenna base themselves are painted in this format where the antenna wire is black, but the spring itself is left in olive drab. On modern era, American and NATO vehicles, these would be in NATO black. However, this vehicle here being from the early to mid 80s time frame, that's something that would happen shortly after this time period. So painting them in the older school format would be appropriate. Carrying along further takes to the 7.62 millimeter NATO ammo can, which is strapped right here conveniently right next to the cupola. This is a kit supply part, went on with any problems. Of course, you want to paint the pieces appropriately. The mount itself is painted the same color of the vehicle, and the strap is NATO green. And of course, the ammo can is an olive green type color. Smoke grenades, of course, are present on this vehicle, and these are the kit original ones, and again, they are decently rendered. One thing you want to keep in mind is that on the real vehicle, the top portions are actually made out of rubber, so when you're painting the model, you want to replicate them in that format. The remainder of the top deck area takes us to the engine hatch grill work along with the engine hatch and the winch hatch itself. All of these details are nicely rendered with nice deep engravings for the grill area and also for the panel line sections where the hatches make contact with the hull. And the kit is nicely rendered because we have these nice little molded hooks that are present for the grill and also nice little molded locking latches here for all of those hatches. Again, these are very finely molded and you want to take care and have the right tooling required to not only remove them off of the sprue, but also to properly deburr them. Not of course to mention, you want to have the appropriate tooling to install these finely molded components to the appropriate locations without there being a whole lot of extra glue smearing from trying to line the, the piece up accordingly. 
The other details to mention on the top area are the two crew hatches. These are kit supplied and went on without any problems. The remaining details are also nicely executed, like what I believe is a wire cutter right here on the front, and also the other cupola periscopes, and over here we have a MG mount that are all present. The periscopes are painted with gloss black, as I often mention in these videos, and as for the Commander's MG, this is also pretty interesting. It is a M240 with spade grips, but you could also still see the pistol grip that is remaining. This is true to form, by the way. The M240s that are fitted with the spade grips actually have a linkage that connects them to the trigger mechanism right there on the pistol grip of the standard M240. The M240 itself is decently rendered. It does the job. The ammo can is molded in this type of condition, and like I often mention, these videos, it's great to render out the ammo can where you have the ammo belt painted in the following configuration. We have copper for the foam metal jackets, a swipe of black paint for the links, and of course the shells or the casings would be brass. The remainder of the M240's grips are painted with gloss black to best replicate a polymer, and if you've ever seen used weapon grips, yeah, they're a bit on the slick and shiny side, and that's best replicated with the painting technique that I just mentioned. On the rear area here, there's nothing really much to talk about. We have some Pioneer tools. Again, the kit originals went on without any problems. For this model here, the wooden handles are painted in olive green, as by this point, this is basically how you would tend to see wooden handle tools on military vehicles. Even the metal sections are painted in olive drab. And of course, this leads us to the interior. As I touched upon before, the interior is fully rendered out with all of the kit supply components and overall in my opinion it does a fairly decent job there's definitely room for improvement but for a basic kit offering you know it could definitely have been worse the mortar does have a really cool feature where it can rotate like this so you can actually depict it's kind of hard to get on screen but you can actually depict the mortar in a multitude of different configurations which is also a nice touch it's kind of the same technique that was borrowed i believe from the tamiya uh, M113 mortar carrier kit that they released also back in the 70s, but it, it kind of reminded me of that with the way Italy executed their kit here, and again, that's for good reason because that Tamiya kit also does a pretty good job. Only unlike the Tamiya kit where the mortar rotates on a poly cap, with this one here, it's actually like a mini tank turret, and you can rotate it to a certain point, and the whole piece unplugs like I just did here. It's very simple, it's very effective, and the best part is it's future-proof, where unlike the poly cap on the Tamiya where that piece can wear out over time, this piece here, it's basically not going to be affected by anything like that. On the hatches, this is something that was interesting on this kit because this kit only allows you to render this model in the following configuration with the hatches in the open state. This is quite different from several of the other mortar kits that are out there where you have an option to either have it in this configuration or all buttoned up. And that's done with, you know, a couple different techniques. But for this one here, they, you know, want you to display it in the following configuration. I guess if you're building it as the mortar variant, this is generally the, the version or the depiction that most people are going to go with. So that kind of makes sense. The hatches are an accordion style system where they open up and fold into each other. Again, very much along the lines as the M106, if I'm not mistaken, the M113 version. It's been a while since I built that kit, but you, I'll throw a picture in so you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, the detailing on the pieces are also very nicely done. We have these embossed X crimp right over here, and we also have the locking mechanism, which on these vehicles, it's a little spring retain latch on each side, then there is a chain that connects the two, and it's coated in a rubber tube, kind of like an inner tube from a bicycle, best way to put it. The way it works is you actually grab the center portion and you pull on it, and by pulling on it, this pulls on the two latches, thus unlocking it and allowing you to flip the hatch open. There is a small little tie down right over here, which of course would be a US military vehicle webbing type material, and of course I rendered everything in the appropriate colors. The rubber tube is painted in rubber black, and the little webbing is painted, well, with the olive green like I touched on before with the jerry cans. The same detailing, by the way, is found on this portion here, only without the latch mechanism, but when you're modeling this section, you want to assemble these, or what I found is best to assemble them in a Subassembly type format. So when the model is painted, you want to paint everything separately. 
right? Also do the weathering on all of them. Once everything is fully painted, weathered, and ready for installation, that's when you go ahead and you start assembling them with their sub-assemblies, where you take these two hatches and you glue them together. Once the glue sets, install them permanently in place, and you do the same thing for the one on the opposite side, only it's a bit easier because it doesn't have that accordion hatch. The locations line up perfectly with the Italery kit, so no hand fitting I found was required for these pieces here to be properly installed. And also by doing this format, this best allows you to mask up the inside over here, thus protecting it from any sort of overspray like I mentioned earlier. Also, as I mentioned before, the mortar can be dismounted from the vehicle and deployed into the ground. And this was something that was referenced earlier with the portion that we have back here for the bottom base. And also there's a section of tripod that's secured on the inside portion of the fighting compartment. But on the model over here, you do not have the ability to render it in that format. So this model, it's purely designed to be rendered in the vehicle configuration that we have here. If you wanna go ahead and render this where the crew disengaged the mortar and mounted it separately, this is gonna require a little bit of extra work and something that's outside the confines of the kit. Moving to the paint and the markings, for the model's paint work, I went with something a little bit different for a vehicle of this era. Generally, for vehicles of this era, they would be in a camouflage pattern. We are talking about the 1980s at this point, and the Merc camo was basically the de facto camouflage scheme of the US military at that time. However, there were several examples of vehicles that I've seen still in their olive drab or olive green type paintwork, and this was something that I wanted to replicate on this vehicle here. Mostly because I really liked the way the model looked on the box art and I wanted to, to emulate that as much as possible with my build. And so far I think I pretty much nailed it with the color. It, the color is my post-World War II American dark olive drab. And then I went ahead and added a multitude of different washes and other filters to it to bring it up to the condition that you see here. Of course, the dry brushing was also used to give it the weathered look that is generally seen on my build. The next thing to mention are the markings, and this is probably the weakest aspect of the kit in my opinion. The markings on these Italery kits are water slide decals, and they are usually hit and miss. Some are better than others. Sometimes you'll use them and you won't have any problems. Other times you'll have them and you may get some silvering like you may be seeing in this video here, which I can attest the lighting is not doing many favors, but even in normal lighting, these decals aren't the best. What's funny is that I use all the appropriate you know, tools of the trade to get these decals on in as good of a format as I possibly could. I used Microset, Microsol, and then the entire model was coated with VMS varnish, giving you for the look that we have here. And to the VMS's varnish, it, their credit, it did as good as it possibly can with the quality of the markings. Sadly, there aren't really a whole lot of aftermarket markings out there for these LAV25s, or as I've seen. So for this one here, the kit supply markings were less than ideal. But for my collection, you know, I could live with the markings. But if you are looking to take one of these to the next level, I definitely recommend sourcing a different marking solution. And at the end of the project, I gotta say, I'm really happy in how this one turned out. This one here was another one of those models that was on my proverbial to-do list, and now that it's been scratched off and added to the collection, it's one that does make me feel pretty good. And with the rate that I'm headed, it shouldn't be too long before I have an example of each of the Italery LAV25 family of kits in my collection, and that's something that always feels good. Which, if my math is correct, I believe there are two more examples that are remaining, but... Again, more information on that is to come as time goes on. And this is a perfect point to pivot us into skill level and recommendation. The Italery LAV25 kits in general are a bit misleading. They look like something that are fairly easy and straightforward to build, and for all intensive purposes, they kinda are. However, they are a tad bit misleading with their complexity. They look like they're relatively easy to build. However, there are some aspects of these builds that can throw you for a curveball. As a quick recap, this would be the fiddly nature of the suspension, and more importantly, those other little details that are just strewn all over the lower hull, which would include those little hooks and tie-down points that I referenced earlier, not to mention even some of the brush guards. These are the type of details that are not really 
easy to snip off the sprue and are pretty tricky to install on the model specifically because of their small size and high fling potential. Because of that, if you've never touched a plastic model kit before, one of these LEV25 kits is really not going to be the best fit for you. This is something where you've already built about a dozen or so models under your belt and by that point there you're no longer a beginner and you are an intermediate builder by that point. Now that's just for the basic LEV25. For this one here that is all still true of course however this one's a little bit more complicated because of the interior that the model supplies you with. The interior is fairly simple with its detailing and its structure but again if you've never built a plastic model kit before the detailing here is going to be a mess really really quickly and catastrophically so because of that this kit here is a firm intermediate to an advanced range kit Outside of those other skill sets that I just mentioned, an intermediate builder should have ironed out the skill sets for things like bodywork, which is going to be needed for this build here, but more importantly, masking, and this is specifically double true for this model's interior. The advanced builder can obviously tackle one of these builds, however, they may feel that this kit here is a bit overly simplistic for some of their skill sets and, you know, what their desire is for looking for a 135th scale build. There have been a lot of other more modern tooling kits on the market of this pattern of vehicle, and more likely those kits are more accurate in comparison to this older generation kit here. However, one thing to keep in mind is that this model does leave lots of room for improvement and a lot of that has been picked up by the aftermarket community. There are a plethora of aftermarket components for all of the LEV25 kits from Metallery. These would include replacement parts made in cast resin, photo etch, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's something out there in 3D print. All of these mentioned accessories can further enhance the model from the kit original form that we have here. However, in my opinion, even with the model being as technically simplistic as it is, it still builds into a very decent representation of the LEV25, and more specifically this example, the LEVM. And because these models are still relatively affordable compared to the other more modern contemporary tooling counterparts, this may be something to look into. And this shuffles us right into recommendations. This model here is recommended for anyone who's an avid fan of U.S. Marine Corps military vehicles, post-World War II military vehicles, modern era military vehicles, as well as just, well, armored cars in general. Another no-brainer would be anyone who's a fan of the LAV-25, be it if you're a former Marine and you served on one of these vehicles, or you're just like me and you just dig the LAV-25 family. This kit here can't do anything but enhance that type of a collection. Something else to consider is with the way Italy rendered this model and also with their execution, this does lend itself for some interesting diorama possibilities. Obviously, the kit is designed to be rendered in the position that we have here with the mortar hatches in the open position and the interior in full view. And with this combination, this again, you can use this to enhance a diorama setting. Although, like I've stated before, the interior is fairly basic with its execution, but if you are going to put in a diorama setting, you could either scratch build or use an aftermarket accessories to hop up the insides further, or you could just load it up with so much battle rattle on the inside that you really can't even see the deficiencies anymore. So that is something, again, to consider, and, you know, possibly something like this, if you haven't thought of it already, might be able to assist in your next diorama project. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale U.S. Marine Corps LEVM. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here or the larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop with new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again, and I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.